everybody. Welcome back to Everyday Miracles Podcast. I'm Julie and you guessed it, I've got something amazing for you today. Uh, I have Tammy Dove with me and uh, well, let me just read you part of her email that she sent me. On January 3rd, 2012, my husband was found dead underneath 300 pound sheet of metal that he had been cutting. Um, he's alive, spoiler alert, but, uh, Tammy is here to share so many pieces of a major, major journey. This is a, almost a type of resurrection miracle really. Um, and I think this is going to bless you. Obviously if you love hearing miracles, but I think if you're in a crisis, there's a lot that she has to share and going through this experience. And also if you're a caregiver for someone that has some complex healthcare issues, um, she's really speaking from her heart today. And I, I really, I really believe it's going to bless a lot of people. So Tammy, welcome. Oh, Julie, thank you so much. I am so excited to have the opportunity to do this and just to, to let people hear about God's goodness because he is just absolutely steadfast and amazing. So our story, actually, even though my husband was found dead the 3rd of January, 2012, our story actually started the 7th of December, 2011. <clears throat> I was doing my devotionals that me morning and um, in my Jesus calling, it said, essentially, I am with you everywhere you go, even in the mundane things I am there. And I'm like, yeah, I know that. I read Practicing the Presence with Brother Lawrence years ago. I fully get it and finished my journaling and decided I was going to clean the shower that morning. And so um, after getting out of the shower, because um, it's a whole lot easier to clean it while you're in it. <laughs> and so I get out of the shower and I'm drying off and I just look up at my husband's sink or the, rather the mirror above the sink. And there is a perfect cross of steam over the mirror. And so I'm like, wow, God, you even <laughs> do showers. This is incredible. And so I'm like, this is, this is amazing. I couldn't believe I was seeing this. And I had the fan running, the exhaust fan running in the bathroom for almost an hour and a half. And that cross was still there. And so looking back in hindsight, I can see that this is the first indication that something was about to change in our lives. And then the next week I started a book by Napoleon Hill called Outwitting the Devil. And the biggest takeaway I took away from that book was the devil uses fear and discouragement to keep you from God's best. And I literally felt like I walked into like a new spiritual dimension. It was like, I could hear the Holy spirit easily, more easily. And then, um, it was like, there was a clarity in my vision. I can't even explain it, but things were sharper. And then, um, the following week, it was the Sunday before Christmas. I have this dream about a 12 ish year old boy and he's got blue jeans on a gold colored rugby shirt and blonde spiky hair. And I knew something was off, but I really didn't know this boy. I didn't know what, but I knew that this was one of those rare occasions that God was speaking to me. And I woke up about three o'clock in the morning after having had that dream and was pondering it. Well, the next Later that morning, we get up, go to church, and as we were walking into church, the couple ahead of us just happened to be my niece's friends, um, Aaron McClurg and his wife and two daughters, and Aaron and I had connected uh, spiritually at a couple of barbecues. We were just prophetically on the same page, and Aaron has blonde spiky hair, a gold-colored rugby shirt, and blue jeans. And I'm like, oh my gosh, this is incredible. And during the worship service, um, God gave me a word for Aaron. And I'm writing as fast as I can and just bawling because it was just so powerful what he was telling me. And it totally made sense having had the dream and now having this word to connect the dream to. And I went up to Aaron once worship was over and I said, you know, I feel like I have a word for you. If you'll wait, I will bring it after church. And he said, absolutely. So church is over and my husband and I go over and we're visiting and I start to share this word. And Aaron, who's a very large, burly construction working guy is just ball and snot and tears as the Lord is ministering to him through this word that he gave me. And he said, Tammy, you're right on. I still received this word. And I was like, wow, that was just so amazing. 
Well, then we, the next night I actually had another dream for him, which I didn't get to him originally until sometime later, but then it, we were at new year's Eve day and I'm going to my Christmas tree and I start tearing it apart. And I'm like, what are you doing? Because I don't take my tree down to the 6th of January, the 12th day of Christmas and my birthday. It goes up the day after Thanksgiving. I put up a, lo- a fresh cut tree. And so, you know, by now it gets pretty dry and does need to come down. But I put the ornaments back on the tree and I went and did the dishes. And pretty soon I'm back at the tree tearing it apart. And I'm like, what are you doing? And I put the ornaments back on and I found another project. And I finally just had to give in. I said, I don't know why I'm taking this Christmas tree down, but I'll tear this tree down. So I get off everything but the lights. And the next morning, New Year's Day, my husband is taking the dogs out for a hike while I get the lights off the tree. And he comes home and comes in the door and says, Tammy, I have a beyond butterflies pregame jitters feeling in my stomach that God is going to do something significant in our lives this year. And I said, really? And he said, yeah. He said, I've never had this kind of a feeling before. I said, yeah, that's odd, Doug. I'm the one that always has the dreams and the weird feelings and stuff. You, you very seldom have anything like this. And And um, he's like, yeah, it's pretty amazing. And so we take the tree out, throw it on the burning pile and get on with our day. And then the next morning we get up and he says, Tam, that feeling is still there. And I know it's nothing that I've eaten. And I'm like, all right, well, that's weird. Well, and the next day he's dead. And it was like, okay, this is so bizarre. So in hindsight, we're able to put all these pieces together to see that God was setting us up for what was about to come. So it was January 3rd in the evening. I was on a phone call and was having trouble getting off the phone um, with the person I was talking to when the call or ID showed that it was my husband's coworker trying to call me. And I knew as soon as I saw the caller ID show up that it was probably not good because there was really no reason for Dan to call me. And um, once I he tried to call again and I still wasn't able to pick up the call. And then his wife calls to tell me what was going on. And after I hung up the phone of getting this message that my husband had been found dead, his face was purple. His tongue was limp and hanging out of his mouth and purple as well. Um, and had been resuscitated, but it wasn't looking very promising. Um, Once I hung up the phone, I was enveloped by this heavy, weighty presence of peace and strength. And what I understood to be an audible voice say, Tammy, this is going to be the hardest journey of your life. But if you trust me, he's going to be okay. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. (sighs) It was, yeah, it was it was hard, but yet it was like, I felt so empowered by those words. And, um, I was a person of faith. I had, I I saw my brother come back from the dead. He wasn't dead for very long. He was found immediately, but he was crushed in a piece of railroad equipment into eight inches, uh, front to back and in a coma for 30 days. And he was the uh, number one trauma center in the United States at that time's miracle for that year, because they, they did not expect him to survive. And at one point they told us he was dying, please come say goodbye. And by the grace of God, he was given a second chance after 30 days in a coma to live and is alive and doing very well today. And does have a few limitations as a result of being crushed. But um, so I had 30 days worth of faith in my pocket. <laughs> Wow. Wow. That is amazing. So when I arrived at the hospital, which was about a 40 mile drive, um, and it took us almost an hour to get there, my mom and I were talking on the way in. It was like deja vu all over again with my brother, you know, we're having experienced that. And we get to the hospital and the first words that I hear when I tell them, you know, my name is Tammy Duff. I understand my husband, Doug is here. The first words I hear is, go get the chaplain. I thought he was dead. I mean, that was what I really thought it. I mean, I was just like, I wanted to vomit right there. (laughs) 
but I held it together and they took us into the little room where my husband's boss and his wife, who were also our friends, were waiting um, with Dan, the guy that he was working with and uh, the mill manager at the time. And, and they're just a wreck. Everybody's a wreck. And I just have this calm and there are, people are crying and, and I'm just like, I, I'm, I'm okay. I'm really okay. Obviously I had cotton mouth, but um, overall I just had this incredible sense of peace. And, and when the doctor came in and, and this was the hospital that I trained x-ray at in 1992. And so I trained under these doctors and some of the nurses and stuff. And so the doctor, <clears throat> one of them that I had trained under and done work for in surgery came in and it, he said, you know, you need to know that this doesn't look good. And we, we really don't have any hope to offer you. If your husband does manage to survive, you know, the chances of him being in a vegetative state are really high. And I was like, well, that wasn't what I wanted to hear, but I still was working on my faith. And it, it took, um, we got to the hospital, um, probably just 9 30 ish I think it was kind of a blur but it was midnight before I finally had a chance to see him because he was seizing so horribly due to lack of oxygen <clears throat> that it took him a long time to get him somewhat stable and I finally got to go into his room to see him and I say hey Dougie it's Tam and immediately he starts seizing again and the doctors and nurses are all yelling don't talk don't talk don't talk and they're saying it's so good that he recognizes your voice that is such a good sign but we don't want him seizing anymore so please don't say another word it's like all right I can do that it's hard for me <laughs> gifted with a lot of words but I cannot talk for his sake <laughs> and <clears throat> and so um some other people went in to see him, but what they decided to do at that point because of the seizures was to do what they called a hypothermic protocol where they would put cooling blankets on his body to drop his core temperature down to allow all the blood that normally would service his organs to go and help his brain heal. And so they said, well, we'll have a better idea in 24 hours, you know, what we've got to work with. And so we go back in the next morning and they're like, well, we still don't have anything yet. You need to wait and come back. And so I go home and I'm trying to sleep and it's just so, so hard. I mean, I'm exhausted and I've never had this happen before, but both of my cats climbed on top of me to, hold, it was like they were holding me down in bed and trying to comfort me. It was just, I mean, it was just the sweetest thing ever. Um, but um, I just couldn't sleep. And so finally we get back into the hospital and to see all of these doctors and nurses with just despair written all over their faces. And they said, you know, we woke him up after the 24 hours and he's seizing again and he's not responding to the anticonvulsants and this just really doesn't look good. And and we just keep having all of these negative reports, but God just kept saying to me, trust me, Tammy, please trust me. And this is for my glory. And fast forward, um, 10 days into it, the neurologist who, or actually I do need to back up just a little bit here. Um, so within that first 24 hours after they woke Doug up from the cooling blankets, um, a mutual friend called and said, Aaron has called me and said, he can't get off the floor in intercessory prayer for Doug. He would like to come to the hospital and pray for him. Is it possible for him to come and pray? And I said, absolutely. So Aaron shows up at the hospital and he says, my father-in-law's had a stroke. I can't pray for him, but I can't not pray for Doug. And it was obvious that he had been in travail. I mean, his eyes are bloodshot and swollen from all the crying he's been doing. He says, I have never had this happen for another individual before. And he walks into the room and he grabs Doug by the front of the hospital ground. And he says, Doug, get back here because God is not done with you yet. And he prays for doctors with hope and he leaves. It's like, all right. So we're waiting for the neurologist to come in to give us a second opinion. And um, probably four or five hours later, the neurologist finally walks in that evening. And his very first words are, you know, it really disappoints me when doctors and people give up hope this early in the game. There's always room for hope. <laughs> and my 
my mom and I are looking at each other like, he has no idea what he just said. So it was just like, here we have this little spark of hope where everybody else has been pouring water on it. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, oh my gosh. So we have all of these ups and downs in this 10 day period and Doug finally get Doug to a medication that is somewhat helpful, but not as good as they're looking for. And <clears throat> 10 days into it, this same neurologist comes storming out of my husband's room, swearing and saying, in all my years of experience and working in this field, I've never had a patient fail to respond as badly as this man is failing to respond to treatment. And I'm just devastated because here's the guy that's giving us hope. And now he's taking all the hope away. So I turned to the nurse who had been so optimistic about my husband's ability to recover and said, <clears throat> what do you think? Well, she throws her hands in the air and she starts backing away from me. And she said, or no, she didn't say a word to me. I just knew by her reaction that she didn't want anything to do with this. And I said, I'm not asking you to diagnose. I'm asking in your experience, what can you tell me? And she said, you are essentially in living hell right now. You need to find the darkest place. Oh, you, your husband most likely will never recover from this. And you need to find the darkest place that you can and have a really good cry and find the brightest spot that you can and figure out how to live in the middle. And when your husband, if your husband should recover from this, he will never, ever be the man that you married. And I'm just like, well, this is a perfect example of fear and discouragement. And I said, you know, I really appreciate what you said, but I have heard every word that you have said to me. And I said, my brain fully understands the fact that he probably isn't going to make it, but my heart is not willing to give up yet. And until my heart changes, I am not willing to concede that he's not going to survive and walked out of the room. And my husband's boss was, <clears throat> excuse me, he was furious. And he said, how can you let these people talk to you like this? And I said, Dave, the devil will use good and gifted people to do his dirty work. And that's exactly what's going on here. She meant no harm. She was trying to help me see <clears throat> from a different perspective. And I said, I have no ill wish against her. She's just trying to help me here. And so at one point, fairly early in the story, I felt like God said to me, Tammy, you are going to know whether Doug is going to survive in 21 days, just as Daniel waited for the answer to his prayer. So being heard on the 3rd of January, 21 days is the 24th of January. So we have lots of ups and downs. Doug does get a little more stable, but he ends up with pneumonia. He ends up with blood clots. All of the awful stuff that could possibly happen is, is happening. Um, but he's not having the seizure problems like he had been having. And so the morning of the 24th of January, I go into his room expecting him to be awakened in his right mind. And instead, the trauma coordinator says, Doug is in a vegetative state. We don't expect any improvement. He needs to be moved to a long-term care facility. We like the one in Post Falls, Idaho. Um, but if you want to keep him in state, you can send him to Billings, which is in Montana. And we don't recommend that. And I'm like, what? And I said, no, it's too soon to make this decision. And she said, no, you have to make this decision today. And in my mind, I'm screaming, but God, you said, if I trusted you, Doug is going to be okay. And this is not the answer that I think that you're, were going to give me. And I said, no, I want my 30 days here. And she said, no, you have to decide today. And I'm also thinking, okay, uh, Post Falls, Idaho is almost 200 miles away over two mountain passes that are treacherous in the wintertime. Uh, Billings is five hours away over two more mountain passes. And I mean, the thought of having to drive and I, I was just racking my brain and, <clears throat> and the trauma coordinator says, you have to decide today where you want him to go. We told you this was coming to today is the day. And I'm just, I'm sick at this point. I'm just my, I get this pit in my stomach and it's like, okay, fine. So I walk out of ICU and the social worker meets me right outside the front door. And she says, well, what would Doug want? Would he want to live like this for the rest of his life? And I said, absolutely not. You're talking about a man whose nickname was Hercules. He was so physically strong. There is no way that he would want to live like this for any length of time. 
And she said, well, um, then it's appropriate to terminate him. <laughs> Oh my goodness. Like we've gone from bad to worse. Oh, here. Yeah, they're going from like possible rehabilitation to, well, let's just, I mean, that I didn't know they did stuff like that. Well, what she told me was if you send him to a care facility, most likely they will not allow you to terminate him there. So you need to do this today. Well, by now he's breathing on his own and had been for a while and he had a feeding tube in. So essentially what we're going to do is we're going to pull his feeding tube and we're going to starve him to death. And I'm just, I'm, again, I'm just like, but God, you said, I just cannot believe that this is happening. And I keep going back to the book of Job. <laughs> it's like, though you slay me, yet I will praise you. <laughs> like, so I had so many people come up to me and counsel me. And it's like, I know this person that was in a coma and they woke up and they were perfectly fine. Or another person would say, you know, I have a friend whose spouse has been in a coma for umpteen years and, you know, just every scenario you could possibly imagine. And it felt like the heavens were brass. I was getting no answer. So we you know, we're in agony and prayer all day long. And finally that evening we go back into Doug's room and, um, some friends that happened to be visiting, they were missionaries from Mexico, stopped by and prayed for him. And while that was happening, um, Dr. Becca Meyer, Doug's um, pulmonologist, happened to stop in to check on Doug. And now his pulmonologist had just retired from ICU care three days before Doug's accident, and but still came over multiple times a day to check on Doug. And he came in that evening and he said, tell me what's going on. And I told him and he said, it's too soon to make this decision. And I said, you know, that's what I thought. And he said, yeah, Doug needs to be here for 30 days before this decision is made. I'm like, that's my number. That's my number. <laughs> and he said, I will do everything in my power to ensure Doug is not moved for a full 30 days. And as he as I'm saying thank you to him, uh, Doug's boss and my brother are screaming at me, Tammy, he's awake, he's awake 21 days later, almost to the hour of when he got hurt. Oh my gosh, that's amazing. I know. <laughs> I know. I mean, I was just like, uh, everybody screaming and clapping. And, and when he woke up, I will say that it wasn't blink wide awake. It was, you know, he was definitely in there. He was obviously trying to figure out what was going on, but he was so heavily sedated with medication that he couldn't wake up. And that's what the neurologist told us the next day. I had totally forgotten that three days prior, he had told me, he said, you know, we need to start weaning Doug off of some of these medications and see what we have to work with. And I had totally forgot that when the trauma coordinator said, oh yeah, he's, you know, not doing well. So apparently there was a communication breakdown in the process. And you know what? She did the best that she could. It happens. We are humans. I don't have you know, I don't blame her for what happened. Again, my thought just keeps going back to this is how the enemy comes against us at every opportunity that is possible. And he doesn't care who he's using. He's not going to use the, the evil looking person on the street corner, you know, to do his dirty work because you're going to be suspicious. He's going to use, you know, those that are closest to you and, and seemingly most beneficial at times. And, and so, yeah, it was, everybody was just incredulous that he managed to come out of that. And then once he was transferred out of ICU up onto the main floor, one of the other neurologists wrote in his medical chart across the whole page, the words, wow, because he was so impressed with Doug's recovery. And the nurses were so delighted. They brought it to me and, you know, we're showing me, look at what, look at what this doctor wrote. Look at what this doctor wrote. <laughs> there's joy some joy in paper charting yes <laughs> yes yes there was some that was amazing yeah and 
he, Doug ended up going, he spent, let's see, a month and a half in rehabilitation where he literally had to learn how to eat, drink, walk, and talk again. After being in a coma, he had lost all of his muscle mass. He couldn't even lift his hand to scratch his nose. He had lost all of that ability. And so he had to go through rigorous rehabilitation, but we've discovered that he was incredibly twitchy. His body would just do a lot of twitching. Um, and he struggled to walk consistently. It was just like he would be going and then he would just lose it. And they discovered that he had ataxia, which was an interruption. And then also he was having little like mini seizures, even though they weren't full blown seizures, they were little sparks that were interfering with the message from the brain to the muscle. And, and that is still something that he battles with today. Um, just having that inability to walk consistently without falling. And he, and he walks a lot, um, but that is one of the, the limitations that he still struggles with. And then um, I had him at home, which was absolutely terrifying because again, we we're 40 miles away from medical care. And it was a lot of responsibility. I was so grateful for my background in healthcare because I think I was able to navigate it a lot better than people who had no idea what to expect. Um, and I also had some background in physical therapy because before x-ray, that was my original intent was to uh, work in physical therapy. So I had a lot of tools in my belt that amazingly, God just randomly seemed to put there <laughs> for such a time as this. Yeah, not random, yes. <laughs> <laughs> but after we had him home for a while, it became very clear that he needed a lot more rehab. We were driving into Missoula uh, three days a week for several hours worth of rehab, but it was not enough. And he was sent to... Um, Omaha to a place called Quality Living Institute, where they were one of the top 10 brain and spine trauma rehab facilities in the United States. And, and they were fabulous. And after I took him down the 21st of May, and after I came home, I was just talking to the Lord. And I said, you know, how long is he going to be there? And he took me to Jeremiah 29, 10, that says, when, once you've been in exile for 70 years, I will bring you home and restore your fortunes to you. And well, I knew 70 years wasn't appropriate, but seven months was. And um, as it turns out, he was there seven months to the day which was pretty, again, you know, God just continuing to speak to me through all of these little signs and wonders. And, and while Doug was down there, they were, a, were they were able to reduce the anticonvulsant amount that he was taking. It started off vicariously because of the Depakote that he was taking was causing his blood to thin. Um, he was also on a blood thinner. Actually, the Depakote was causing the platelets to not form, which is an important part of the, the coagulation process. Um, <clears throat> and so he hit his head and ended up with two brain bleeds, ended up in the hospital again, back in ICU. And that's when they discovered that the Depakote that he was taking was interfering. Um, so they immediately discontinued 6,000 milligrams of an anticonvulsant. And I mean, I was terrified because knowing how horribly he had been seizing and how much medication it took, because he was on 13,500 milligrams of anticonvulsants at that time. Oh my goodness gracious. And, you know, a high amount of anticonvulsants for an average person is 2000. And so the, it, people are saying, you know, a horse couldn't function with this amount of medication. So how is this man managing to do what he's been able to do? So it was, you know, just God using an unfortunate circumstance to help change things for the better. And I questioned the doctor and he said, we have two choices. He could either bleed to death from a brain bleed, or he can die of a seizure. You know, <laughs> these were our options. Mm -hmm. So here we are back at life and death all over again, but he came through it with no problem whatsoever. And once he had that amount of medication taken out of his system, it was like a veil was lifted off of his eyes and you could see more of his personality start to come through. And he became a lot sharper, 
um, because his brain was actually able to function again, even with the damage that had occurred to it, he was still functioning at a level that was more his old nature than it was before. And then um, later that year in October of 2012, they took him off of another 4,000 milligrams of anticonvulsants. So then he was down to 2,500, 2,800 at that point. And um, so, yeah, it, it was just amazing how things turned around. And so he was able to come home the 21st of December and in Montana, that's just not the best time of year. <laughs> we have lots of snow and stuff to contend with. Um, but God apparently decided I needed a lot of testing because not only was Doug injured in January, the coyotes got my favorite cat in October. I found him spread across the field where they had, well, his hair spread across the field where they had played with him, which was, you know, heartbreaking. It's like, I've already been through all of this trauma. God, how much more do I have to go through? So, you know, I find my, my cat dead in October. And so Doug's coming home the 21st of um, <clears throat> December. Uh, my grandfather ends up in the hospital and is dying as I'm waiting for his plane to come in. And we finally get Doug home and find out that they had enlarged the, the width of his wheelchair and it wouldn't fit through the interior doors in our house. So here it is one o'clock in the morning because his plane was just delayed and he needs to go to the bathroom and I'm having to rip the doors off of the inside of the house to get in into the places he needs to go and it's like oh my gosh but we got that done he made it home and within that week that he was home we ended up having to put our old dog down we knew she needed to go but we were waiting for Doug to come home so he could say goodbye and it was just like she knew that he'd come home to say goodbye and she decided it was time to go so you know I just thought I don't know how much more of this I can handle, Lord. It's just like one blow right after another. And so I did. I spent so much time in the book of Job <laughs> looking for encouragement. <laughs> wow. Oh, goodness. I'm so and sorry. so once... Once we got Doug home and settled, we ended up having to have a caregiver so I could still work. Um and then he really wanted to walk, but because of his falling, the therapist quit walking with him because typically what they would end up doing was pair him with some petite little woman and he would fall, they would fall, they would both get hurt. And so they just said, you know, walking's not a good idea, but he was so determined that I decided I would drive out of the mountain valley where we live down into the, the, the lower area. And there was a bike path that we could walk on and it was bare because we were still high enough up in elevation that we had a lot of snow to contend with. And so it was around Easter time of 2013, we started walking and our first walk we did four tenths of a mile and yeah, which was really good. Yeah. And, but. But he's the kind of guy that tell him what he can't do and get out of his way while he shows you what he can. <laughs> I love that. Yeah. And he wanted to push more, but we had to go back to the car. And so I said, you know, it's time to go back. And he was pretty happy, but he was exhausted. Well, within two weeks, we were up to 3.6 miles pushing a four-wheeled walker. Wow. And I jokingly said, well, at this rate, we will be ready for the run wild Missoula marath half marathon that they do every year here. And he mentioned that to two of his providers who thought it was a great goal. So then the joke was on me because now I was the one having to come home from work, get him down there and do this training with him. But we ended up walking, pushing the four wheeled walker 13.1 miles in three hours and 41 minutes. Oh my goodness. Wow. So for a dead guy, he was doing pretty good. <laughs> That's amazing. Wow. That's wonderful. 
So yeah, yeah, that was a huge accomplishment. It was, you know, uh, all of the caregivers that have stood beside him, you know, they were so excited for him because I was still working. Um, my office was adjacent to the hospital complex where he had been. So I was able to check in with those people, the doctors and nurses and, and therapists and stuff that took care of him frequently and give him updates and stuff. And so, yeah, it was just such a great feather in our cap and such a sense of accomplishment and and, um, and while we were walking the marathon, you know, people are like, what's the deal with the guy with the bike helmet and the walker. And so we were able to share Doug's story and so many people were encouraged, um, you know, cause many of them that we passed did have their own story. It was obvious that they had their own limitations, but it was so much fun to encourage people. And, and as I would share the story with a lot of my patients and coworkers, so many would tell me I have been so depressed. I've been so discouraged. I've had no hope in my life, but after listening to your story, I now have hope again. And, and it was such, such a warm feeling. And so I don't feel like my feet even touched the ground for like a year and a half after Doug got home and, and started to re rehabilitate. And we ended up having to move to get closer into Missoula. We had a mile of our own driveway to plow and didn't have the resources to pay somebody to do that long-term. Um, and nor was I able to run the heavy equipment to be able to do it. Even though I'm kind of a Renaissance girl, there's a lot of stuff I can, but running a very old antiquated road grader was not one of them. Um, we ended up moving in October August of 2013, I wake up after having a dream. And in my dream, my supervisor tells me that she's got bad news. They've sold my x-ray equipment to St. Patrick's Hospital and I no longer have a job. And that played out 14 months later when we finally got a buyer for our house and we're able to make the move. And I'm telling my supervisor, we can finally move. She says, I've got some bad news before you sell your house. You need to know that we've sold your equipment to the Providence group and they are not willing to take you with it. You will not have a job as of the end of the year. Oh no. Yeah. Yes. And I loved my job. I so loved what I did. No, this is sounding a lot like Job. You're right. I hope it turns around. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, still you're having these beautiful miracles along the way, but then another hit, you know, Right. And again, I mean, it's like God warns me. So I wasn't completely shocked. And, and I'm thinking, okay, I know you're going to have to provide, but how? And I knew I'd get unemployment. Well, then I filed for unemployment and somebody else had already filed on my unemployment. So I have identity theft. <laughs> oh my goodness. On top of that. <laughs> and that's hard to undo because I've had that uh, to me before that I was totally innocent and I have to prove something. It's like, how do you prove Right, that? right. Well, and I didn't have to do any proving because I was one of several thousand people whose unemployment benefits had been filed on in five different states. So I didn't have to do that, mm -hmm. but it did take a little while to get it resolved. So I, but what I realized is I so desperately needed a time to rest because for two years, I had just been going, 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 and I needed a chance to rest. I took some computer classes um, through adult education and um, was started to work on my book that I was writing because after his accident, everybody's like, you need to tell the story. You have to write a book and never having written a book. I thought, well, I guess I could start and see what happens. And so I did start a little bit of um, the process of getting the book going but I desperately felt like I needed to work. I felt like I had to be the one I needed health insurance. And my employer offered me a job three months later, going back, working in scheduling. And I thought I could do it, but I couldn't. And I see now that it just wasn't God's timing for me. The, um, just so much about it. And I have to confess, it was really difficult to go back to work for half the wages that I had been working for. Yeah. And yeah. And I had, I just decided that 
Um, I wasn't ready to be in that environment and decided I could clean other people's toilets for more money than I was making do what I, doing what I was doing and possibly be a little bit better off mentally and started that. And then um, a neighbor gal was telling me about a job at the hospital in working in an endoscopy that I could probably do. And that I, again, I would have health insurance. And my thought was, is that's a foot in the door with the hospital. And maybe once I get my foot in the door, I can get back to my x-ray machine. Well, <laughs> that wasn't the best thing. <laughs> I, yeah, it was, again, it was just like, I, I think God wanted me to trust him to be my provider. And I was the one trying to make it work. And I was miserable. I was physically in a lot of pain because of the demands of the job. And I, I used to help my husband log and I've had a very physical life. I had horses, injuries with horses. And so just the demands of that particular position and where I was at was creating a lot of mental and physical pain for me. And I started drinking a lot because I was in so much pain. I just wanted my pain to go away and I could have a couple glasses of wine or a couple beers and it would take the pain away. And also Doug struggled with a lot of impulsivity. He would do things um, that put him in harm's way. He would injure himself and furniture and other things got broken in that process. And I just I found that the alcohol took the edge off of my frustration, but it was also creating a lot of depression and I wasn't recognizing the depression so much um, immediately, but as I began, you know, I, and I knew, I knew I was going down the wrong road and I would pray and pray and pray. And God would just tell me, Tammy, you need to trust the process. This isn't just about you. And it's like, oh, great. <laughs> I get to be somebody's example. This is lovely. <laughs> but I got to the place in my job in endoscopy that I just couldn't do it anymore. And one night I was in so much pain. I took two Advil and two Benadryl in order to help me sleep. I went to bed at nine o'clock at midnight. I'm still awake. I get up and I get on my face and I said, God, I cannot do this anymore. And he said, well, then you need to quit your job. And I said, we're $1,000 a month short of making our payments. I won't have health insurance. And Doug is not in agreement that I can quit my job. And he said, you trusted me to raise the dead guy. Why can't you trust me to quit your job? And I said, well, Doug's not in agreement. I'll quit my job if Doug decides to agree. And so I climb back into bed and the next morning when the alarm went off at five, I get up and Doug gets up with me and he said, how'd you sleep? And I said, well, I didn't. And he said, why? And I told him and he said, you need to quit your job. Oh my gosh. <laughs> well, that's good. Like, what? And he said, Tammy, you need to quit your job. And I'm like, are you sure? And he said, you can't live like this any longer. And I can't live watching you live like this any longer. You have got to quit your job. I'm like, what about our payments? And he said, God will take care of it. And I'm like, okay. So I thought, well, here goes nothing. <laughs> This is really scary. I get in my car to go to work, fully intending to give him a 30-day notice that morning. And I turn on the key and the radio starts playing. I sure wish I had enough faith to get out of this boat I'm in by casting crowns. Oh, wow. And I'm thinking, God, you're funny. <laughs> you're really funny. <laughs> so I give my notice and within that first two weeks, the young couple that wanted to buy our last piece of property up Nine Mile texted and says, we've got a buy-sell document filled out, ready to sign if you want to move forward on the sale of this property. Wow. I'm like, oh my gosh, this is so incredible. And within three weeks of giving my notice, our attorney called and said, work comp has made a settlement offer that you guys need to accept. Wow. Timmy. Yeah. Yeah. It was his timing was so amazing. Absolutely. So amazing. 
And I will tell you that in the work comp settlement, you, you think that you end up, you, you think you should get a fair settlement, but that's not always the case. And while we are very, very blessed to get what we got, if Doug could have been able to go back to work in his field as a welder and pipe fitter, he would have been able to make in three years of working straight time, what they paid him for his 11 remaining years of work. So that seemed really unfair. It was a bitter pill to swallow. And we did not get an attorney immediately because we thought we're Christians. God's on our side. It'll all turn out, you know, but in the end, and, and to back up and say that it wouldn't have changed his wage settlement, but it would have changed some of the other things. Cause I signed off on stuff like uh, upgrades in the house that could have been taken care of that they told me that this was the only amount of money that was available. And so I signed off on it. And our attorney told us later that, oh no, there was a lot more money available because we ended up putting a lot, the majority of that settlement money into the remodeling of the house that we ended up buying because it's very difficult to find stuff that's all wheelchair and handicapped accessible. And, and he has been out of his wheelchair now for let's see, six years, we've been here six years, so probably five and a half years. He has not been in his wheelchair other than when he plays adaptive tennis and he stays in his wheelchair to do that. Um, but so I would counsel anyone um, to get an attorney from the get-go to make sure that you get everything that's owed to you in the process. And we didn't want to be one of the statistics that was such, you know, that was out to get workman's comp. And obviously we weren't. I mean, it was just like we brought the guy back from the dead. <laughs> but um, so we were able to start the remodeling process. But in that, Doug had a lot of... Well, <clears throat> some short-term memory issues, and and then he would get really angry at times when things didn't work according to the way that he thought they should go with his brain injury. And um, normally, he would have been able to filter his emotions, but with a brain injury, it's very common that you lose that ability to filter. And so you just kind of say things. And in the process, he said some incredibly hurtful things. And I mean, they were just daggers to my heart. And um, so in one particular time that that happened, I fixed him. I drank a whole bottle of wine. So I was miserable the next day and I had to take him to the gym at the University of Montana where they have a gym set up specifically for people with disabilities. And I left him there while I took our new puppy and our older dog over to the nearby park to, to exercise while he was doing his workout. And as I start to head back to the gym, this gentleman approaches me and he starts talking about the puppy. And then he wants to know if we live in the area. And I explained to him, no, we don't. And why we're there. Well, then he starts talking to me about all of this brain rehab. And I said, you seem to know a lot about brain injuries. And he said, I'm a brain, in, a brain rehabilitation specialist. I'm like, oh, that's really interesting. And he looks at me and he says, you are not just surviving your husband's accident. You are thriving your husband's accident. I'm like, what? <laughs> I'm thinking I'm this miserable and hungover and this is thriving. I don't think so. Oh. <laughs> well, if anybody knew Doug and I prior to the accident, they would have known that Doug always had a chainsaw with him because that was just part of what he did. In addition to his work at the mill, um, he was constantly cutting down trees and I had done a lot of wedding cakes. In fact, I was in the middle of baking a wedding cake for our pastor's son and daughter-in-law. And this person said to me, yep, you are thriving your husband's accident. I see you juggling a calendar, a cake, a chainsaw, and a couple of other things. I'm like, what? Who, who is going to know anything about a cake and a chainsaw? And he's like, yeah, he says, you're juggling a calendar, a cake, a chainsaw, and dot, dot, dot. And I'm like, this is absolutely incredible. And he says, well, I got to go. Bye. And he walks off. 
And I'm like, wow, what just happened? And as I looked back on it, I really think God sent me an angel to tell me that he saw me. He saw the misery that I was in. And he just wanted me to know that despite the fact that all I could see was where I was failing, he was actually seeing how hard I was working to succeed and to get both my husband and myself to where he wanted us to be. Beautiful. Yeah. I mean, I still just think back to that time and just think, how did this happen? But yet he, he just reached out to me. And, and so I still knew that the alcohol was something that really needed to go. And I also, with a history um, of sexual abuse in my past, I also had used food as a coping mechanism for a long time and was still using it. And um, in, let's see, 19, looking at my dates here, in, um, it was the spring of 2019, a friend of mine uh, told me about the Life Coach School and how it was so helpful to his wife to finally deal with her weight issues. And I knew that they also taught on overcoming alcohol abuse and <clears throat> having tried a couple of AA meetings, never feeling like I fit in, I was looking for some other resource. And so I thought, well, I can actually coach people with all my background, with everything that I've done. I've done a lot of inner healing work in the past. And, um, and through all of this, Doug and I did a lot of counseling. We had to do marriage counseling because it was at the point that I was ready to put a bullet in my head. I, I was that depressed. And so we ended up starting the counseling and that really did help. It didn't resolve everything, but it certainly helped significantly. And then through the coaching, I was able to learn how to transform my mind. And that's a lot of what we did was thought work and and through that, and um, a woman by the name of Annie Grace uh, wrote a book called This Naked Mind, all on alcohol recovery and how to rewire your brain. And so through that, I was finally able to let go of the alcohol and just really feel like I could, you know, speak into other people's lives in that area as well. And, and God never once ever shamed me in that. I shamed myself a ton. I did so much shaming on myself, but he was just so gracious, gracious and kept saying, just trust me, trust this process. Because again, it's not for you. There's somebody else that needs to hear your story. And so um, I have been able to get a handle on my alcohol use and getting a handle on my eating. I'm not exactly where I want to be, but I figured, you know, I'm 58 years old. <laughs> I didn't get here overnight and it does take a while to rebuild those neural pathways. And so we're, we're a work in progress as we all will be until the day he takes us home. One thing I wanted to ask you, um, as far as processing anger and grief that you have in this process, can you give any insight on that? What I didn't realize that I was doing was I was not allowing myself to grieve. I wasn't allowing myself to be angry. I was stuffing it. And that's also where I was medicating with the food and the alcohol is um, in my twisted Christian thinking, I just kept thinking, well, if God is using everything together for good, then why should I be upset about this? And so I didn't give my permission, myself the permission I needed to grieve and to be angry. And I had every right to be angry. My life had just been turned upside down. The man I married was not the man that I was living with. And even with all the healing that he has had today, he's still not that same man. And so in that regard, the nurse was absolutely right. And, but neither are any of us the same person that we were a year ago or 10 years ago or any of that? So we have to be willing to allow ourselves the grieving opportunity and to know that it's okay because God wants to heal that part. And I just listened to a, um, a teaching from Dr. Michael Hutchings on God heals PTSD and our 
in Isaiah 61, where it says God came to heal the brokenhearted, he defines the brokenhearted as a shattered heart. And I really believe that that's what happens in these kinds of situations is our hearts get so shattered, but we have to allow him to come in and do the healing and put those pieces back together to, again, because he's the only one that can. He is the only one that can truly put our broken hearts back together. You know, Humpty Dumpty couldn't be put back together, but we sure can when we allow God to do the work. Mm -hmm. And so I think that that's a really important piece. And so my, my healing in that area didn't happen until I started working on the book and allowed that stuff. I recognized it as I was writing that I did really truly need to grieve. And I was able to do some and still feel like there's more to do, but I can trust God when the timing is right to do all of that. Yes. Well, just like you said before, we're all, we're all a work in progress. Absolutely. Yes. Absolutely. I think I have to tell you the story about the diamond necklace. Yes, do, do. Yes. This, this little beauty right here. Um, it was five years ago in January, my husband forgot my birthday and I was really hurt by that, even though I know he has a brain injury. It's like that. This is one of the things I think that is so difficult in this process is, you know, they're broken, but you can't see the damage. And so it's really easy to forget that there's a broken brain in there. And so you want them to respond normally. And in our selfishness, we, our ego, I guess it would be, gets upset when they're not responding appropriately. And um, along that line, I, I have to say that in that same vein, in my very deepest and darkest of moments, there were days I wish he would have died. I was hurting so badly and so exhausted that I had those thoughts. And then I felt so ashamed of myself for thinking that. But fortunately, a good friend of mine, somewhat older, her husband was dying from Lou Gehrig's disease 25 to 30 years ago. I don't remember exactly how long, but she was caring for him. And in her exhaustion, she came home from work one night. He wanted his pillows adjusted. He was in his recliner and he needed the pillows adjusted. And she took a pillow and covered his face with it to smother him and asked him if he felt better at that point. And she said, Tammy, I can't tell you how ashamed I was of myself for doing that, but I want you to know that you're going to get to this place. Mm -hmm. And that was probably the very best counsel I got from anyone is you're going to get to this place in your exhaustion and brokenness that you're going to do things that you would never otherwise do. Wow. So don't be surprised. And God knows you're going to do them. But if you allow him to come in and be your healer, he will do that for you. And so having said that, I had made an arrangement with my husband. I was going to go clean a house for a friend. I was going to come home, take him to the gym. I really wanted to go to the gym and I get partway home and I find him about two and a half miles from the house, walking through the snow on the side of the road, not on the bike path, but on the side of the road, putting himself at risk. And I was so angry because one, he put himself at risk and two, I really wanted to go to the gym. And so I get home and I decide I'll take the dogs out for a walk. I'm out walking the dogs. I run into a neighbor and she says, I saw your husband down the road by Walmart which now means that he's five and a half miles from our house. <laughs> and I'm like, you've got to be kidding me. Are you sure it was him? She says, yeah, no, it was. I saw Doug down by Walmart. It's like, wow. Okay. So I finished walking the dogs and by now he's gotten home and I said, you must've forgotten about the gym. And he's like, yeah, I totally forgot. I'm really sorry. Well, then we'd made arrangements to take me out to dinner two nights later. And while we're at dinner at my favorite restaurant, he says, well, he said, really the reason that I was walking down there was I went to um, the jewelry store to get you something for your birthday. And I'm thinking, well, that was really sweet of you, 
but I know that jewelry store and I know it's really expensive. <laughs> and he says, I know you've never wanted a diamond necklace, but I felt like God told me I was supposed to get you one and consider this to be an investment. Well, now the alarm bells are going off in my head as I'm hearing investment and I'm getting really nervous because we had limited amount of savings and I had saved money from the remodel budget to have the exterior of the house painted because I really didn't care for the color and being such a person that loves color, it's really important to me. And I asked him how much it was and he told me and I was sick because it was like half the money that I had saved. And I'm trying to keep, you know, positive face and say, oh, that was really nice. Well, we go to pick it up and the jeweler, she is beside herself with anxiety, wondering if it's going to be okay. And um, I assured her that it was well, then I asked how much it was, and it was $2,000 more than what he had originally told me. Oh, no. <laughs> so here I have this beautiful, sparkling diamond necklace that I never, ever wanted, and I'm having to come to terms with it and to realize that I'm now not going to be able to get my house painted. And so I'm I'm wearing the necklace and I go out for a walk and I'm just screaming at God, how could you let this happen? You know, I never wanted a diamond necklace. And I finally shut up and I hear, well, maybe I wanted you to have that necklace. And I'm like, what? Maybe I wanted you to have that necklace. And I says, well, fine. <laughs> If you wanted me to have that necklace, I guess that's just fine, but I want my house. <laughs> oh my goodness. <laughs> so I said, I guess we'll figure something out. I'll trust you one more time for this process. So we go to church and I, I go up and I start talking to a friend of mine that's a counselor. And I said, you know, Jody, I said, I know when you reject the gift, you reject the giver. And I don't want to do that to him but is there any way? And she starts bawling immediately. And she said, Tammy, there's something very prophetic about that diamond. I said, yeah, that's kind of what I thought. So I go back up to the front of church and I start worshiping and I immediately start bawling because God spoke to me and he said, Tammy, all you can see is the wrong things that you have done. But what I see is the jewel that you have become. Oh, yeah. So all the while, all I can see is the places where I failed, how I failed to trust him, how I failed to meet my husband's needs. And all the while, God was cutting me. He was faceting me. He was polishing me. He was preparing me to illuminate his glory to shine him everywhere that I went. Wow. Yeah. And so then later I learned um, from a woman by the name of Catherine Skurja, who has written a book called uh, Paradox Lost, I believe is what it is. <clears throat> and she talks about how our Imago Dei, our Christ-like image is like a diamond. It reflects God's glory. However, in life, we end up covering our Imago Dei with all of our shame, all of the wrong things that we've done, just all of the guilt, the condemnation, all of that. And so his glory doesn't get to shine out from us, but he wants to come in and he wants to bring healing into those areas. Well, then as part of the analogy, she uses the peanut M&M, where the peanut is the diamond, the chocolate is all of our crap that we cover our diamond with. And then we build a hard candy shell around all of our garbage so that nobody can see it. But what God wants to do is he wants to come in. He wants to break off that hard shell. He wants to remove all of that garbage in our life so that our Imago Dei can absolutely shine for him. 
And so that's what I feel like he's really done through so much of this because I have, I've worked on so many areas of healing and he, he showed me recently in a dream, how I have actually taken my Christ-like image and I have use that to cover my shame. As I have been vulnerable, as I have gotten all of this out in the open and don't have these secrets anymore, I don't have the shame around them. Yes, I'm not proud of what I've done or, you know, what? It's, it's not like I tell people, oh, look what I did. I, it's, but at the same time, it's like, I know that it no longer has any control over me. And so by allowing him into those dark places and to heal me, I now have a freedom to walk in that I have never walked in before. And so he has used all of this to facet me, to shape me, to be a vessel that just illuminates him everywhere I go. And it's pretty awesome. That is amazing. And I know you're writing some of this down. So can you talk a little bit about your book that you're? Yes. Yeah, so yeah, uh, oh, definitely a labor of love. Now I understand when they say writing a book is a birthing process, <laughs> but I have a book which is titled When Hope Rises to tell the story of our miracle and then the challenges that have come with it. And it is currently with Trilogy Publishing. Um, we're hoping to have it out by March and um, it will be available everywhere books are sold and I, Amazon and I will have some as well. And I think you can reach me through my website at TammyDove.com and, um, and find out more information about who we are and how to get a hold of us there. Yes. Yes. So well, I'll definitely share it when I, when it's out, I'll let people know. I'll post it on my, all my platforms. I think that's wonderful. And I, I'm so inspired by all the pieces of your testimony and the fact that you're so vulnerable, vulnerable to share the hard parts of it too. Um, you know, having the miracle, your husband, having the miracle of healing that he had, um, all the different people that played a part you know, the man in the park, um, the sign that you had in the very beginning is really beautiful. And the messages that God has spoken to you throughout it and just the whole process, the fact that your marriage, you stayed together, you know, I can't, right. I, I get my feelings hurt really easily. Like, yes, I actually almost cried when you talked about how you have a brain that's not optimal and you're getting hurt by this person. And it's hard to see them as like someone, like if they had a broken bone, you would obviously help them and give them grace for getting around and doing things. But when someone is hurting in their mind, there's someone that I love very much that is struggling in that way right now. So that really resonated with me. So, um, so if you can just uh, reach out to someone, I know there's someone that's listening that feels hopeless. Um, maybe they're in the crisis that you had with your husband. Maybe they're in that place with their marriage, getting through this whole pandemic. Maybe they um, are caring for someone that it just feels like it's overwhelming. Like mm -hmm. what can you say to that person? Hang on. Um, I, Jesus is right there with you in the middle of what you're going through. He has not left you. He has not forsaken you. He has his arms around you. He weeps when you weep. That all might sound cliche, but it is so true. And you are going to be able to look back and you're going to be able to see where he has carried you through this storm. And as you continue just to reach out to him and to surrender, that I think for me was one of the hardest parts is I had to surrender. I'm a get her done kind of girl. And I kept thinking I have to do this on my own, but I didn't. And um, I just had to allow room for him to come in. I had to allow myself to feel the pain. Instead of numbing the pain, you need to learn how to feel the, the pain. Um, and you will get through this. It might not look like you expected it to look on the other side. I know that 75% uh, or greater marriages do not survive these kinds of circumstances, you have to be incredibly intentional about making them survive. Counseling is incredibly important or coaching. 
Um, I think that those are avenues that are so incredibly important because we need an outside perspective because all we can see is the pain that we are currently dealing with. And so it's really difficult to see outside of where we're currently at. And one of my favorite authors, Andy Andrews, one of my, his quotes that I so dearly love, he said, adversity prepares you for greatness. And I said, at this point, I'm going to be flipping awesome. <laughs> <laughs> but greatness is an influencer. It's not a station, you know, it's not more money. It's none of that, but it gives you an opportunity to be an influencer. And this is what I have seen through our accident is that um, I have been able to influence so many lives for the better. And it just so fills my tank when I get that opportunity. And so for any one of you that are battling with a loved one with a, a brain injury or a health condition, or you're battling with weight issues, with um, sexual abuse, with alcohol, with any form of shame, Jesus is right there waiting to take that shame away. And there are so many avenues that that can happen from, but part of it is just really spending the quality time with him. And you might not think that you don't have that time, but I'm here to tell you what, if you don't carve that time out for him, you're not going to be able to recover as quickly as you would when you just sit at his feet and just listen to him and allow the words to soak in because you have got to transform your mind. That's where all of these changes take place is up in our brain is when we can get our mind to align with the truth. And he is the truth. And, you know, um, we're not going to get through this life without su suffering. <clears throat> after, after Doug ended up with the brain bleeds and was back in ICU, God gave me another download and, and it was first Peter one, six and seven. And he said, you will suffer as I have suffered but you will also share in my glory. So I really want you to look into your situation and realize that Jesus is right there suffering along with you. He suffered already so that you could endure it, but he's with you right now in the midst of your suffering. And you're also going to share in his glory. And that's where we're at right now. I think we're in the position where we get to share in his glory. We did in part way through the journey, but even more so now when we can say, look what the Lord has done. You know, there's that little song, he healed my body, he healed my mind. <laughs> I, I'm not musically gifted, so I won't sing. <laughs> oh, that was beautiful. Thank you so much for that message. Mm -hmm. It's very, it's very needed today by so many people. So I appreciate that. That's awesome. And uh, I'm going to list all the places to get a hold of you. And when I do have um, a link for your book, I will post that because that's awesome. Be awesome. I can't wait to see it. So uh, <laughs> thank you for today. And I'm going to say a quick prayer. If it's okay on the way out, I just want to, um, just want to praise the Lord. Um, Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you so much for Tammy, and I thank you for her husband. I thank you for the miracles that you have done over and over, and the, the way that you've been able to speak to her, and and the way she has responded in faith, and um, just that you're always with us, Lord. And I, and more than all of your miracles and things that you do, just like we thank you for who you are, Lord, that you're mm -hmm. a good Father. We thank you for your promises, your word that guides us as we face struggles here on earth. And I just pray for every person listening right now that they would feel your presence, Lord. And I thank you. I thank you for this vehicle of just getting the testimonies out there, Lord. We're so grateful. It's Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you. And for those of you watching, I have a new computer and I wasn't sure she was showing up. So I switched the view a little. I hope that wasn't distracting. Um, but anyway, uh, Tammy, thank you so much. And uh, for those of you listening, um, if you have a miracle that you would like to share with me, please reach out to me at everydaymiraclespodcast at gmail.com. Thank you for listening. Mm -hmm.